It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1, 2023. This episode of Working Overtime is brought to you by Season 3 of The Relentless. The Relentless moves past generic business advice to bring you valuable insights from trailblazers who are reimagining success. Tune in to hear inspiring conversations with guests like Michelle Curran, an F-16 fighter pilot turned entrepreneur, and Stacy Smedley, a nonprofit executive combating climate change in the construction industry. From Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate, The Relentless is one podcast you won't want to miss. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Working Overtime, Working's bi-weekly, advice-focused iPad to Working's MacBook. I'm your host, Karen Hahn. And I am your other host, Isaac Butler. Hi, Isaac. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, Karen. How about you? How are things out out west? Is it as rainy and miserable as it is uh, here in New York? We just finished having our rain, so we are back in nice, sunny weather, so I can't complain. God damn it. <laughs> well, what are we going to talk about today? Cheer me up. Let's let's help the people so that I don't have to dwell on the on the rain. <laughs> so while I was thinking about what we've covered in past episodes, there was one thing that struck me. So we have an episode on offering criticism to somebody else and how to offer constructive criticism. But I thought it could be good to talk about what happens after that or rather on the other end of the equation. Sometimes you get feedback that instantly makes sense and you can tell actually improves the work. But sometimes you disagree with the feedback you're getting. How do you push back in a polite way? How do you decide whether or not it's a hill you want to die on or something you're willing to let go? It's tough to say no. So I want to start with a personal anecdote before really digging into this. Isaac, have you ever disagreed with your editor? And if so, what did you do in that specific situation? Yeah, I mean, I think disagreements big and small come up during the editorial process all the time, right? Particularly good example I can think of was actually with the introduction to the method. And I I may have talked Mm -hmm. about this before. I'm sure, Ben, my editor would not mind me talking about it. But, you know, the original introduction that I wrote for the book didn't work. It was just really confusing unless you were already familiar with the kind of conceptual terrain that the book lays out. And part of that is that I don't really love introductions to nonfiction books. Sometimes mm-hmm. I feel like by the time you're done reading them, you don't really need to read the rest of the book. And so I just didn't want to fall into that trap. And I kind of didn't know what else to do. And I really tied myself in knots. And so, <laughs> you know, when he wrote the the letter of feedback in response to the draft, one of the things he said is like, look, you need a new introduction. But the suggestion that he made for what the new introduction would be was just wrong for the book. It just was not going to work, you know? And I was a little freaked out about that Mm -hmm. because this was our first kind of big disagreement. But I wrote to him and I was like, I completely agree with you about the problem. The solution you've offered is not going to work. And let me explain to you why that solution is not going to work. It's going to (laughs) do X, Y, and Z. And he actually wrote me back immediately and he was like, oh yeah, no, you're totally right. Let's figure something out. And then we talked on the phone. We figured out a new introduction. I sent it to him. There was still something that didn't quite work about it. We talked on the phone again. We figured out a third introduction. And that one is the one that that is actually in the book. So the nice thing was, was that he was right about the problem and wrong about the solution, right? The real difficulty is when you and a collaborator disagree on what the problem is or even whether the thing they're talking about is a problem. Mm -hmm. That's much more of a minefield. But in this case, because we both had the same goal in mind, the disagreement over how to achieve that goal was fairly straightforward to navigate. And also we had a long creative partnership at that point and trusted each other. 
Okay, now to zoom out a little bit. I think, as you said, disagreements are pretty inevitable in life, not just in the creative process. If you've never disagreed with the people around you, then I'm incredibly envious of you. But generally speaking, I think that people's tastes and visions tend to be different enough that even if you feel like you're on a pretty similar wavelength, you'll butt heads at one point or another. Would you agree with that sentiment? I I mean, I guess you've already said that you do. Or am I being too cynical? Not only do I not think you're being too cynical, I think that... (laughs) That we should be suspicious of creative processes if they don't have disagreement and conflict in them. I'm not saying you should be throwing chairs at each other. I'm just saying if you agree about everything all the time, if you're not involved in constructive creative conflict, which can sometimes Mm -hmm. get heated, but it probably means that someone involved is holding back what they really think in order to protect someone Mm -hmm. else's feelings. And the work is going to suffer as a result of that. The difficult part is being honest with someone and respectful of them and maintaining both the work and your personal relationships. It's, it's, it's hard. It's a complicated thing to do, but you have to learn how to have disagreement productively. Yeah. And so that question, how do we even approach it? Right? Because Mm -hmm. again, it's really, really difficult and differs in so many ways, depending on the situation. And for instance, like the answer to what to do will change depending on who exactly it is that you're working with. Is the person that you're disagreeing with a peer who's just offering feedback? Is it a co-collaborator? Is it someone who's technically above you, like your editor? How do you feel the relationship changes how you deal with feedback? Oh, yeah. I mean, that definitely changes, right? A peer's feedback, Mm -hmm. wonderful, great, whatever. You could take it or leave it, though, right? I mean, like, they don't (laughs) actually have any relationship to the work. They're they're trying to help you, and you can be grateful for that without necessarily using everything they say. Mm -hmm. In editor's feedback, you know, you're usually not contractually obligated to take their suggestions. You know, ultimately, it's your name on it. You can push back, and in some cases, you can even say, hey, I get where you're coming from, but I'm not changing it, and here's why. But you do have to pick your battles. You have to be careful and strategic about how you do that. But a creative collaborator, like a partner in the creation of something, you really can't just go, no, I'm not taking that suggestion. They're yeah. your your co-author, whether it's a book or a painting or a film or whatever. You know, you really have to hash things out and come to some kind of consensus. Like when Dan and I were writing The World Only Spins Forward, mm-hmm. you know, one thing that we did, and this was Dan's suggestion, it was a smart one, was Because it's an oral history, if a quote appeared in one of his chapters that he drafted in a chapter that I drafted, we put off choosing which chapter would go into until Mm -hmm. the very end, right? Because it was like, well, eventually we'll be able to look at the whole thing and see where that goes. Mm -hmm. But we did have to have those disagreements and argue about who should get their lines wherever, you know? Otherwise, you end up with like the same quote six times in your oral history, which would, would not be good. I think... In all cases, no matter who you're talking to, there are some things they have in common. It's worth trying to figure out where they're coming from, you know, is the big one. A friend of mine has this adage that people giving you feedback think they're the doctor, but they're actually the patient. They are better at identifying the problem like, oh, my knee hurts than than fixing it. And often you are actually the one who has to figure out how to fix it. Yeah, it's weird. I guess you're both patients in that respect, because like the editor's job is to tell you like this isn't working, but then it's sort of more up to you to figure out what to do about it. But it's also like your baby. (laughs) Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, and one of the things that was wonderful about working with Ben, for example, is, you know, when I turned in that first draft for him, he was like, it has to be cut by this amount. Mm -hmm here are the things that I think are strong about and here are the things that I think aren't quite working. But he did not say like, these are the passages you have to cut. You know, he, he Mm -hmm. set the mission and he let me figure out how to do it. Yeah. That's the best kind of like relationship I think to have with your editor. That said, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I, I wanted to address one thing that you said about like working with an editor. Again, you're not contractually obligated to take the, criticism that they give you or like to do something about like every single problem that they point out if you think that it's working. But again, it's good to be able to say that in a polite way or otherwise (laughs) explain what you are doing or what your original intent was so that they can better work with you to guide it in that direction. Because this is just speaking from experience. Like I have heard a lot of horror stories from editors about writers who don't take any criticism totally. at all, like who will not take any suggestions. And in that case, it's like, what's the point of you working with this person? There really isn't one. And again, this is a sidebar, but I've noticed this happens so, so much more if the editor is younger particularly if they are a woman yeah. or if they are a person of color, they tend to get more resistance. So just like be aware of what you're doing when you work with an editor. Like nobody is there 
to sabotage you most of the time. And it's worth like figuring out how to work with this person uh, as opposed to saying like, no, like my writing is perfect and no one will ever touch it. Because if you're thinking that way, then like no one will want to work with you. (laughs) Yes. No, I absolutely agree with it. What I was saying before is definitely like within the bounds of like being a good human being and a good person to work with and everything like that. And Karen, I think you've done a very good job of articulating that. Editors are almost never out to sabotage you, except for the nefarious Sam Adams at (laughs) Slate.com. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sam is the nicest guy on earth. That's the only reason why I said that. Sam is (laughs) wonderful. But it is worth noting, like, sometimes if you have a bad feeling about working with an editor, like, you were, it is not always the case that your relationship is going to be good. Because, like, I have personally had this experience a few times where I was like, oh, I can tell in the process of writing this piece that this person would rather be a writer than an editor. Even in those cases, though, you have to be careful about how you, like, toe the line or who you talk to about being like, hey, like, here are my feelings about this subject. and I feel like we could work out a better way to work on this together. We're going to take a short break, but we will be back with more thoughts on pushing back without pushing too far right after this. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1, 2023. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep. When you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Hello to our listeners. Is there a particular creative struggle you'd like to hear us tackle? Let us know by emailing us at working at slate.com or even better, you can call us and leave a message at 304-933-9675. That's 304-933-WORK. Okay, so to get back to the topic at hand, I also want to know if there are cases in which you disagree, but let it go. When do you decide that it's okay to go with feedback that you don't necessarily agree with? I think I've done this before where I might not necessarily agree that something has to be changed, but given that feedback, I'll change the offending sentence or idea, but sort of compromise by changing it into a different third thing rather than what was immediately suggested or otherwise explaining what my original intent was. What about you? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think every writer has a moment where they do that. Mm -hmm. I will say when we're reaching the end of an editorial process that has taken in a while, you know, like most things that I've done for Slate, the editorial process has actually been very fast, right? But if if you've gone through multiple drafts, there comes a moment where you just want to give up, you know, where you're just like, God, I just am over this. (laughs) And, And you can start to like kind of preemptively concede to any note that's given to you. I'm saying you, but I really mean me, the royal you. Uh, (laughs) And and in those moments, you actually have to be really vigilant because what's going on is just you're exhausted. That's really what's going on. You're just, you're yeah. actually like, like, you know, you're, you're so near the finish line. You're like a exhausted runner, but I will say, sure. I do it every now and then for one thing, 
if you have the time, energy, space, money, whatever, I feel mm-hmm. like there's no harm in at least trying the idea someone is asking you to try. Like, like as an editor myself or as a director with actors, I would always get frustrated when someone just like wouldn't even try the idea. You know, it's like, we have time, just try it. If it's bad, something else will come out of it. It's just as easy as that, you know? And so, so I do think that like, if someone says, Hey, try this in the draft, you don't even necessarily have to show it to them, but you should take the time to Mm -hmm. try it. Cause then you'll be able to talk about what doesn't work, but you know, with a piece of lower stakes writing. So not like a book or, you know, an essay, a review, I'm far more open to just going with a change, even if I'm on the fence about it. Like Dan Quise, who I've worked with a lot. He's edited a lot of mm-hmm. my pieces. You know, like there will come a time where he's like rearranged the wording of a sentence. It doesn't change its meaning. It's not how I would write it. But I'm like, do I really want to fight about like the order of the subject, the verb and the predicate in this sentence mm-hmm. at this point? Like, no, it's time for this thing to get out there. Let's get it out there. Yeah, that's totally fair. And in the instances in which saying yes or compromise feels impossible or just the wrong decision, how do you decide how far to take it? When do you concede to the person that you're working with? Obviously, I think this is also informed by your working relationship and probably several other factors. But broadly speaking, how do you decide a certain thing is a hill that you do want to die on? Oh, boy, I have a I have a bit of a of a story for you about this that I think connects <laughs> to your earlier thing about editors who want okay. to be uh, writers. But the short answer to your question is, It's when the meaning of the argument has changed. That's Mm -hmm. when I dig in my heels. When it's like, you are actually, whether you realize it or not, you're kind of putting words in my mouth. I don't agree with the thing you are saying, right? Like that said, editors are human beings. Sometimes they express or put into your writing something you disagree with and they don't even mean to. They're just like, they're a different person trying to write the same thought and it just comes out in such a way that it turns into something you wouldn't say. And it is absolutely okay to just be like, I disagree with that. What I actually think is this and talk it over. You're going to find a solution there. And again, at the end of the day, it's your name on the piece. Don't say things you don't believe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the worst case scenario, you're right, Karen, there are editors out there who don't write. And what they're really looking for is writers who will convey their opinions. What they want is (laughs) a mouthpiece. And I had an experience where someone approached me about writing a piece at a website slash newspaper that I will not name. And when I had this inkling, like a little voice in my head was like, I think they just want you to write something that they, and they've already figured out what it is and they don't want your original thought. And so I did the thing where I was like, Hey, this is actually what I think about this. I think we actually disagree a little bit here, but I'm, I'm happy to write it if you want this. And they're like, well, would you also talk about this other thing? I was like, yeah, sure. But I'm going to do it from my perspective. Well, yeah, I turned that piece in and there began a miserable two month process of writing and rewriting and this and that, where they kept trying to get me to say things that I didn't believe and to kind of, Mm. if I remember correctly, kind of rant against cancel culture a little bit or, you know, whatever it was. And I was just like, (laughs) I was getting really fed up. And then I realized that we had never discussed the rate. And so I wrote them and I was like, by the way, what is the rate for this piece? And they were like, oh, "Oh, we, we typically pay $250. I was like, okay, I'm killing the piece. I I was just like, I'm not doing doing this. I'm, it's not I'm, worth it's it. Not, yeah. It's not worth it. And then they came back with more money and I was like, no, no, you don't understand. I was trying as nicely as possible to be like, I do not want to work with you. Like, <laughs> so don't just like, no, let's not do this anymore. And we went back and forth and eventually I ended up pulling the piece. And you know what? Sometimes you got to kill the piece. It is better to kill the piece than yeah. to have something out there on the internet forever with your fucking name on it that you do not yeah. agree with or believe in. Okay, I have a story about this, too, because I remember, like, it was around, like, when Succession first came out, and I managed to, like, Succession pill all of my coworkers, and we were all like, this show rules, this is amazing. And then somebody came in the next day and was like, hey, can someone write about how the season one finale sucks? And we were like, none of us think that. And they tried for like the full week to get somebody to write that piece. But it was like, none of us think this. Like, we literally like don't agree with you. Like, you should write it if you want this to go up on the site. Like, we are not going to do this because we fundamentally don't agree. And this sort of thing has happened, honestly, a couple of times. And once to the point where like, 
I had a piece that I submitted based on one editor's guidelines get totally rewritten by a second editor who was like, actually, we want it to be more like this. And I was like, this is not a me problem. Yeah. You guys clearly haven't uh, coordinated. But in those cases, it generally comes down to how much I'm getting paid for something as to how much I'm willing to push back, where it's like, okay, for X amount of money, I'm willing to go through a few more hoops. But for Y amount of money, I'll say, hey, like, I really don't feel good about this. And if this is the direction it's going to keep going in, then I would rather kill it or not have my name on the piece. Yeah, totally. Anyway, point being... It's honestly really hard to push back on stuff like this because you fear like not getting the paycheck, you fear burning a bridge. And again, if you've got a really good relationship with a person that you're working with, maybe this question isn't as hard. But let's think about it hypothetically. Do you torture yourself wondering what to say in these instances? Because I certainly do. Oh, my God. Well, I am a people pleaser, Karen, so I hate it. (laughs) You know, the the middle child in me is like, oh, no, I'm going to disappoint them. There's times I've been kept up at night by the anxiety, literally by the anxiety of, you know, digging in and, and sticking by my guns. Sometimes... Actually, it feels worse to do that with someone you have a good working relationship with Mm -hmm. until you've done it a few times and then the two of Mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. know how to to disagree. In terms of burning bridges, though, I will say, because obviously I burnt a bridge at that place that I pulled the piece from, (laughs) but I would never want to write there anyway. You know, like one thing to ask yourself when you start to get too worked up about sticking to your guns is actually how much do you value the relationship? You know? Yeah. And if it turns out that like, actually, I'm okay never writing for these people again, then different moves open up to you. You know, in that that circumstance I told you before, I was like, I never want to write for these people again. So they are offering me more money to do this again. And I said to them, I will do it if you print whatever I write in the next draft. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course they said no. And then we killed the piece. But like (sighs) I could make a demand like that because I actually didn't care about that relationship anymore. I would never make a demand like that with, Sam Adams or, you know, Dan or Forrest or whoever. It's like, like, that would be a ridiculous thing to do. But again, throughout the important thing is to still like, you want to walk away from that situation feeling like you were not an asshole, that you were a good human yeah. being, that you tried to make something work. And I think, you know, you can be guided by that too. Yeah, sometimes you can just tell if somebody that you're working with, like, does not value your work or time. And in those cases, like, it is kind of best to cut the cord. That said, on that downer of a note, we will be back with our final thoughts on this process right after this. Womp womp. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1, 2023. Listeners, I just want to remind you that if you're enjoying working overtime, please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, we would love for you to rate or review the show. It really does help new listeners to find us. And if Overcast is your app of choice, please hit the star to recommend the episode to others. All right, here is my final thought on this subject. Maybe most importantly, how do you push back without sounding like, well, a dick? I think it's very easy for feedback to feedback to come off as very condescending or otherwise misunderstanding. It is a very fine art to give feedback to feedback. Yes, totally. And I think it actually employs the exact same steps, tools, and attitudes as giving good feedback. Do you know what I mean? I think it's the Mm. same thing and that you want to like, where is the person coming from? Honor their point of view just as you would want yours honored. Do you understand where they're coming from with the note, like you might not. And if you don't, don't leap to rejecting the note, ask them questions to learn about it more. Right. And within Mm -hmm. those questions, you can make it clear that you found the note confusing or it wasn't helpful or what was going on, but you'll probably get to somewhere deeper within that where consensus can actually be found Mm -hmm. with feedback. You disagree with, you want to, I think 
the thing you want to really focus on is just articulating what you were trying to do with that section of the work, the, that corner of the painting or that sentence or paragraph or scene or whatever. The person giving you feedback may not have realized what you were trying to do because your work actually isn't clear enough yet in its purpose or because mm-hmm. they're, they were a little obtuse, they had a bad day or whatever it was. And so they could maybe help you with suggestions of how to bring that out. Or maybe they understood what you were trying to do, but they disagree with the fact that you were trying to do that or they don't think you did it well enough yet. And actually like, Figuring out as specifically as possible what the actual problem is that they're talking to you about, I think in most cases is going to lead to a good place. Because again, the two of you almost certainly share the goal of making this the best possible thing that it can be. And you just have to keep that in mind that they're a human being too. And, you know, a little bit of the golden rule, I guess. Yeah, ultimately, it comes down to something that I think we've said multiple times on working and working overtime, which is just to be a sensitive and empathetic human being towards others. And that will ultimately help all of your working relationships. Yes. And I think our help is of limited use if that's just like not a yeah. thing you're interested in. Do you know what I mean? Again, if you if you want to just like big dog the person or whatever, you can, of course, do that. I just like that's not my style. And I would leave that feeling really bummed out. It's also worth noting, like these bad experiences spread. Like I've talked to my fellow writers about like editors that have had really bad experiences with. And I know my editor friends have talked to me and their other fellow editors about writers who have treated them disrespectfully and basically gotten them blacklisted. It's like, you just want to be a good person. That is all it takes. Yeah. And everyone here, when we're talking about writing, and and I think that most of these lessons are abstracted to other art forms, right? But particularly when we're talking about writing on websites, you have to remember that everyone is working too hard for not enough money. You're working too hard for not enough money. The editor's working too hard for not enough money. That's like the more you can be a decent human being, which is not the same thing as saying, keep your problems to yourself. Don't make noise. Like sometimes you have to do that, but the more you can be a decent human being about it, the better you will feel, the better they will feel. And probably the better the end result will be, although it's not a one-to-one correlation. Absolutely. And on that note, that's all the time that we have for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And if you have questions you'd like us to address, we would love to hear from you. You can send us an email at working at slate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. If you'd like to support what we do, sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash working plus. You'll get bonus content, including exclusive episodes of Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood. You get little bonus interview uh, sections on our regular show of working. You get full access behind the paywall at slate.com. And you get to rest easily at night knowing you are helping to keep this show going. Big thanks to Kevin Bendis and to our series producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back on Sunday with a brand new episode of Working, and in two weeks, we'll have another Working Overtime. Until then, get back to work. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.